Thanks, Rachel. And hi, everybody. So as Rachel said, I'm talking about the, the current show, which is uh, this combination of works by Charlie Hammond. They cover the last 15 years or so of his practice with quite a lot of recent work and Charlie's selection from the, the vast holdings of the Hunterian. And in case any of you haven't seen the show and it's on till the 16th of October, so there's still plenty of time to do so. I've just included a few uh, kind of overview images of the of the installation. So you get a sense of the atmosphere around it. And I think we've we found that visitors have said, and it was certainly our aspiration to make a show that would feel uh, light and fun despite the serious uh, engagement with art practice and with our collection that's so much a part of the project. And it is probably in some ways the first show that I've been involved in at the Hunterian's Curator that isn't in some way or other hard work. <laughs> so uh, the show is really about trying to be quite immediate and uh, create the opportunities to engage and enjoy works of art through any kind of number of ways, but rarely through having to kind of read an essay to understand what the work is or to kind of through any mystery about how the work is made. The works that share, the works that Charlie selected and the works that he's made himself are kind of immediacy. That means they are, they are not hard work to uh, get on with at all. And I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, these themes of work and non-work in the show because they run throughout it and how the idea of the workaround is a, a particular way of thinking about them. So you can see, you know, in these kinds of uh, installed images, works by Charlie Hammond on the wall, and then in vitrines that have been repurposed from other Hunterian displays, so none of them have been made for this exhibition in particular, works from our collection by, for example, Charles Rennie McIntosh, or uh, Eileen Agar, or uh, Jean de Buffet, Andy Warhol, uh, many others. So Throughout the exhibition, we encounter historical works and works by Charlie Hammond, kind of coexisting. And Charlie's work in particular uh, has this innate kind of humor and directness to it that uh, stands out, you know, I think, as you move around. Something that's really important to say about the show is that not all the things that Charlie selected from our collection are works per se. So Whereas all the works that he's contributing are artworks, some of the things he selected from our, our collection are, are kind of artistic ephemera or tools of production, like these stencils used by Charles Rennie Macintosh, for example. So these are not the, the artwork in itself, but something related to its production. And they show also a, a form of production that involves kind of labor-saving techniques or ways, efficiencies, ways of um, transferring pattern that again, have this kind of immediacy to them. And within the selection too, there are uh, allusions to work in different parts. This is a, a fantastic work from uh, the artist Sybil Andrews called Sledgehammers in the 1930s, where the, the image of work is kind of abstracted and, and celebrated. The energy of a laboring human body is a, a key kind of formal preoccupation in a work like this. So, we also find works that resonate with Charlie's practice that, that are sort of about how the artist can avoid working hard at their, particularly at the task of representation, using very direct means or subversive means to de-skill the art of image making. One of the things that I, I really appreciate in this show is that Charlie is interested in uh, approaches sometimes very, very important sort of famous historical artists like Oscar Jorn or Helen Frankenthaler or L.S. Lowry that are, feel very inclusive of the non-artist, of people who might uh, not have an incredible facility with um, the uh, dexterity for drawing, for example, and showing how really amazing art images that work can be made using uh, a, a different kind of technical vocabulary. So whether that's a stencil in Macintosh's case or this sort of scratchy childlike drawing by Asker Jorn, uh, Charlie's made space to find these kinds of um, works and to share them with our audience and to put them alongside his own. So I'm now going to kind of 
get a little bit more into this question of work and non-work and artistic labour in relation to the kind of predominantly 20th century oeuvre that, that Charlie's um, been concerned with in the show and which I think has a particular relationship to that theme. So my, my jumping off point here is going to be a friend and collaborator of Asker Jorn, uh, the Danish artist we just saw, and that is the the key figure in French uh, letterism and situationism, Guy Debord, who claimed at least to have been responsible for this uh, graffito that was made on a street in Paris in 1953 and gives the, the kind of sage advice which many artists have taken to heart since, I think, and not only artists, that you should never work. But this is a kind of rule of, of how to live a, uh, enjoyable and uh, creative and free life in 20th century uh, modern culture, you have to never work. So the question, of course, that that kind of attitude throws over to artists is, what does it mean to work as an artist and to make art works in the spirit of not working as an ordinary worker? And this is a, a kind of hyperbolic uh, comparison, but we could say there have been a couple of approaches to that Kind of provocation or to that those sets of questions around how the artist relates to other kinds of work we could align them broadly with an artist like alexander rodchenko who you see on the left hand side of this image in uh, kind of workers clothes that he himself designed with the, the workers pipe um, the image of kind of leisure and enjoyment in your break so the idea of aligning the artist with a kind of proletarian figure uh, of art and on the right hand side of this slide, we see Marcel Duchamp uh, also smoking his pipe, but in the role of artist as game player, as strategist, famously Duchamp claimed to have retired uh, from art, completely withdrawn from the art world to become a chess player. We know that was uh, not entirely true, but that was the image he had, say up to the mid uh, 20th century, the artist who had given up work altogether. He referred to himself in his famous interviews with Pierre Caban as uh, somebody who was merely a breather and not a worker. So to, to simply exist and to make art out of your existence or to align yourself with proletarian labor and transform in a revolutionary way the world, these are two, two kind of polar opposite versions of how to deal with the artist as worker. And artists throughout the 20th century have, have returned to these questions of work and not working in the 1960s, the politicization of, of radical avant-gardist art uh, took the form in New York of the founding of the Art Workers Coalition, in which artists very deliberately and consciously and publicly declared themselves to be workers to the point at which, and this is one of many uh, such initiatives that have happened since, they could go on strike. The idea of an artist who uh, or an, a group of artists who might withdraw their labour and what that would mean is already interesting in itself, I think. But here we see a crowd gathering to hear the artist Robert Morris uh, speak at the New York art strike against racism, war and repression, which was um, one of the uh, a kind of outgrowth of the Art Workers Coalition with which Morris had been very closely associated in the 60s. So to, with, to, to consider yourself a worker and to be able to withdraw your labour was another important position. And more recently, maybe we've seen artists acknowledge in a way the, the, the non-productive nature of artistic work. This is a, a kind of placeholder for that in uh, the, the work of the Belgian artist, Francis Elise, who moved to uh, Mexico in the 1980s and kind of invented himself as an artist there, having previously trained as an architect. And here you see him in a central square in Mexico City, advertising his labor as an artist, not as an image maker, but as a tourist, as somebody engaged in leisure alongside the plumbers and electricians who uh, offer them their skills and services in that space ordinarily. So he's playing with and thinking about the artist as a kind of a worker who is not really a worker. And bringing it closer to Glasgow, uh, the wonderful artist Scott Miles made this piece in 2001, in which he, having noticed um, that on St. Vincent Street, where all the tall office buildings are in Glasgow, you would often see people gathering outside the buildings to have cigarette breaks. His participation in the project for that site was to uh, 
turn into paid work the act of not working and of of being uh, sick, taking a cigarette break. So he had these effectively delegated art workers that he paid to smoke cigarettes outside an office. So they were they were at work pretending to be on a break from work. So this interest, this ongoing interest in what it means to be an artist at work in the context of a of, um, modern organization of labor, what it means to withdraw labor and so on, we could trace it through a you know, whole much wider range of works than these, but these are the placeholders of the idea. And I think really importantly also, something that happens in 20th century art is that the notion that one of the things the artist does with their skill is hide their labor. So in other words, make a representation as Fantin Latour does in the 19th century, in which the actual physical manual labor of making the image has been concealed in the, the convincing lifelike naturalistic representation that's produced. That's something that's completely kind of thrown overboard in the 20th century and accentuating, exaggerating, acknowledging the, the physical manufacture of a work itself, the actual work and material labor of its production becomes more and more important. And really beautifully in, in work around we have a series of works by Charlie Hammond where uh, he synthesizes in a way this acknowledgement of how the work is made and the circumstance of how it's made with the fact of uh, that the, the time spent in the studio is not always productive, is not always hard work or manual work. So in, the, in Studio Blooms and in, in a couple of other works in the show, we have um, these coffee cups that have been used, disposable coffee cups that Charlie mixes paint in the studio and allows to dry as, while he's working and cuts up to make blooms. So they're images of, of something that's happened in the studio kind of without the artist, something that's going on. They're very conspicuously material. They belong to the everyday life world that we all inhabit. We would all recognize them and recognize their kind of tactility and so on. So the idea that the artist's labor is not uh, a kind of highly refined skilled labor based on manual dexterity and the concealing of the work of making a representation, but to kind of play with it, you know, brings us back again to these, these questions of how a work shows that it is work without valorizing particular kinds of labor that are no longer um, predominant in the way we think about art production. So again, a juxtaposition that's maybe kind of slightly overblown, but I think is, is useful here. One of the things that's happened to work in the late 19th and early 20th century, of course, is become more and more um, regimented, organized, managed. And a key moment in that was the development of the time motion study by Frank and Lillian Gilbreth in the United States, work that is also closely aligned with somebody like um, Taylor, who, who looked also at efficiencies and, and organizational structures and factory work to, to increase profit and maximize each worker's productivity. And one of the, the techniques the Gilbreths used to understand inefficiencies in what each worker's body was doing was uh, attaching uh, lights to them and making long exposure photographs you see on the left and that same technique was used uh, by a photographer for life magazine to capture picasso at work um, in 1949 so these these are two images of uh, the production of a, of a ethereal kind of work a, a, a trace of work that no longer exists they exist only in front of the, the lens of the camera, but they're so different in nature and in how they signify that it, they seem like a useful comparison somehow. So the, the worker is not consciously producing a representation at all. They're, they are, the representation we see is, is of all their kind of inadvertent um, actions, which are rendered as inefficiencies in the view of a, a factory owner, for example, or those conducting a time motion study. Picasso is showing us his capacity to make an artwork out of nothing through, through his kind of um, capacity, kind of protean capacity to uh, make line continuous and define shape and so on. And again, if you think about uh, an artist working today and thinking about what it means to make an artwork, these two poles are very interesting. The idea of how work itself has become something to be managed and maximized and made efficient and profitable and how the pressure on the artist is sometimes to be the exception to that, to be the person who is capable of freely kind of make, 
drawing something out of nothing, making something appear in the air. I think these um, are useful coordinates for thinking about what Charlie Hammond is up to in some of the works and work around. And in particular, um, and this brings me back to, to when I first started sort of observing these themes in, in Charlie's work, um, a series of, of paintings that he exhibited in Berlin um, a decade ago called The Sweats. So we have one sweat painting in particular, not actually the ones I'm going to show. I'm going to show you some other examples from the series. And one of the things that's really interesting about these works is that they, they use techniques like rollering, so being able to transfer uh, a motif. It's often this motif of the, the sweaty armpit, which alludes to work and perhaps to anxiety as well. They use that motif to generate painted imagery, but they also, um, and this is true of other works of Charlie's and other works in our show, they often uh, take one canvas or a series of canvases and cut them up to make new works. So one of the things that uh, happens in Charlie's work as a practice, one of the forms of labor in acts, is of this kind of recapitulation of work. So Charlie talks about paintings often, or painting as a medium, often collapsing on itself. So within particular works, he's interested in how something doesn't work, how it falls apart, so how it capitulates. But then in his practice, he often, I think, is interested in recapitulating those forms. So in mistakes or uh, repetitions or errors or paintings that have got to a certain point and been abandoned, they can be um, brought back into other works various different ways. So they're often constructed. And they often also, and this is true of the developments of that series of works, make specific reference to forms of work that are not always recognized or valorized as work. So we've thought of the factory worker and the artist, for example, um, in previous uh, comparisons, but domestic labor, doing the tidying up, wiping, cleaning, um, washing up, those kind of things are often also parallels to the process of painting, to taking care of all these things that are continually falling apart and needing to be remade. So a kind of maintenance labor is going on um, often and alluded to. Again, this is not a work in the current exhibition, but it feels of a piece with the concerns with work that are going on there. So in Work Around, uh, we have this repeated motif of the J cloth as a, an artistic uh, reference to domestic and commercial labor, to low paid work, to tidying up something that like the, the workers um, time motion study is looked at as a, a possible area of inefficiency and so on, or of, or of work that we, that we are reluctant to do and doesn't have high cultural value. So it's preoccupied with all of those things. But um, I want to develop this a little bit with an art historical comparison, if you'll bear with me. So this is um, a very famous painting about manual work from 1850, but uh, destroyed in uh, aerial bombardments in the Second World War. So the French artist Gustave Courbet and his Stonebreakers, one of a number of works about the, the French countryside that he made in this period. And I'm going to uh, read a little bit from, from a text that I first wrote for, for Charlie's exhibition in Berlin uh, a decade ago, where he showed the sweat paintings. And I had this work in mind for a couple of reasons, as hopefully you'll see. So. To make the artist into a worker and work into the subject of art has been a goal of various types of realist painting. But celebration of or sympathy with the figure of the worker is easily compromised by the obvious contrast between the kinds of labor depicted and that which produces the depiction. In a debate that resonates with Hammond's interest in these themes, the art historians TJ Clark and Michael Fried have offered contrasting readings of the relation between manual labor and artistic labor in one of art history's most notable realist depictions of work, the Stonebreakers. The painting, as you see, shows a young boy and an elderly man, each dressed in ragged clothing, working on the construction of a new road. It's given formal coherence by the arrangement of the worker's limbs at right angles, something echoed in Hammond's new works. Um, this is new when I wrote this text, of course, so the works from the sweats, which have this continual repetition of the, the rectilinear motif of the sweaty armpit. For TJ Clark, the Stonebreakers is, quote, an image of labor gone to waste and men turned stiff and wooden by routine. 
It's remarkable, not only because it presents work without recourse to narrative or drama, but also for Clark, because he thinks Courbet recognized his own class-based, quote, radical incomprehension of the psychology of the working man, and therefore anonymized his subjects. They turn away from us, we don't see their faces, in order to negate any conventional bourgeois reading in terms of a personal tragedy or a generalized but individual dignity of labor. In this and in other works from this prolific period of his career, Clark argues, Courbet touched on the presence, even in the countryside, of class conflicts, to the displeasure at the time of an urban bourgeoisie who preferred to imagine the countryside as a rural idyll. Not only do we find alienated workers in the countryside, but also the bourgeois de campagne. And of him, Clark says, he had, it seemed, evolved. At times, he could even be unconscious of his bourgeois status and its demands. One day, he could wear the black dress coat, the next, the peasant smock. And Charlie, I should say, has a particular interest in peasant smocks as a motif. They turn up sometimes in his work. And the idea of the artist playing off the, the idea of the peasant and the middle class uh, landowner in the countryside is you know, something that Clark develops in, in great detail, very influentially about Courbet. I won't go further into that here. But the idea of the artist in some way role playing the worker in this amb ambivalent or ambiguous way is really key. So Michael Fried, in contrast, sees the key issue in this work, not as Courbet's tact in relation to the specific class politics of the French countryside, but rather in how the Stonebreakers pictures alienated labor while also being, quoting Fried, a densely corporeal metaphor for an act of painting that involves an equivalent to the perfect reciprocity between production and consumption that in Marx's economic theory defined non-alienated labor. So for Freed, the Stonebreakers is ultimately a representation of absorption in work. And specifically in Freed's view, and this is a kind of madly brilliant or brilliantly mad reading, I think. I really love it though. Um, specifically, it's an allegory of the painter's uh, body as they themselves stand before the painting. I propose, Freed writes, that the figures of the old Stonebreaker and his young counterpart may be seen as representing the painter, the holder's right and left hands, respectively, the first wielding a shafted implement that bears a distant analogy to a paintbrush or palette knife, the second supporting a roundish object that might be likened to the admittedly much lighter burden of a palette. So we, we imagine Courbet in front of this work, he's holding a brush, he's holding a palette, and then he represents in a way his own body at work through the vehicle of these two other bodies, one holding this round uh, griddle, the, um, the other, the, the hammer. So is it too far-fetched to see something of this in Charlie Hammond's work too? Some sense that it is indeed the artist's own work that's allegorized by all those sweaty arms and J cloths and uh, stains and repetitions and uh, various other mechanisms that turn up again and again in the work. By allowing free reign to the humor inherent in the idea of a painter seeing a hammer and a sieve as his arcane tools, Hammond moves us decisively beyond the terms of Freed's modernism in which the work is only ever really about itself. If Hammond's works are about painting, they are also pointedly about painting's uncertain relationship to a transformed world of work and a transformed artistic context for representing it. In their uh, amazing uh, book, uh, Luke Boltanski and Eve Ciappello identified what they termed a new spirit of networked capitalism with its extension to an ever greater number of wage earners, the lack of any distinction between time at work and time outside work, between personal friendships and profes professional relationships, between work and the persons who perform it. The freedom, spontaneity, and creativity once identified with artistic work, implicit in Freed's notion of absorption, are now recuperated as the prerogatives of capital. And this is above all what makes the effort to think about art as work something that could well make the artist break out into a sweat. How on earth are you meant to deal with these injunctions not to work, to deal with work, to think about what your own work means in a context where so many of us are now tasked not only with being productive, but being, with cre being creative at the same time and so on. So by way of conclusion, I'm gonna move to uh, another image of 
the artist's tools and materials. So imagine Michael Fried uh, again standing by to, to tell us that these uh, palettes and brushes could allegorize the artist's labor, their right and left hand working in unison. This is an image of a vitrine that for many years showed James McNeil Whistler's palettes, brushes, mall sticks, and paints uh, in a vitrine in our gallery. And when Charlie and I were looking in the, the spirit of the workaround for already existing display cases and walls on which we could hang the works in the show, we went out to a Hunterian storage facility and we found uh, this object, the sun faded fabric from that vitrine with the artist's palettes and brushes no longer there. So this is uh, like a ready-made version, a Duchampian version of what Michael Fried sees in the Stonebreakers, the artist's palette having in a way been translated into the image itself. But really crucially, it is not a work. It's not, it's a, merely a piece of exhibition um, packaging in a way. It's a, a piece of a case, it's a piece of a vitrine. It looks so much like uh, Charlie's own work um, with its play on the tools and materials of artistic production. It's the seeing of faces within these um, other forms that we wanted to show it in the exhibition. And lots of people have told us that they particularly enjoyed um, this discovery. So this is one of the key Hunterian inclusions, but it's not a work and it wasn't made by any manual labor. It was made by Charlie seeing the possibility in it of showing it as a thing for us to be interested in and enjoy. And I think that tells us quite a lot about how he works, which is not to belabor the point that he is able to make beautiful drawings or uh, very interesting representations, but to think about what it means to see something as valuable or interesting, even if no work has gone into its production. Um, this has been a question that's haunted art, as I've suggested, throughout the 20th century and into this one. A for example, most famously perhaps in, in the 1970s, the scandal of Carl Andre's equivalent date, the so-called Tate bricks, 128 untransformed fired bricks presented as sculpture and sold to the Tate by the artist, which led to any number of kind of parodies and lampoonings in the, the British press at the time. And it's really interesting, they turned again and again to the image of the worker to make this um, kind of satire. So cartoonist after cartoonist played on the idea that, that somehow there'd been a confusion between ordinary labor, uncreative and boring labor, bricklaying, for example, and artwork. We see it again, people were um, doing it ad hoc, but companies like Heineken knew it was iconic enough they could riff on it. In Charlie's own show, in Workaround, we also encounter a kind of cartooning um, element. And in this, uh, this is a reference for those of you too young to remember to the, the famous Tetley tea folk who were used to advertise uh, a particular brand of British tea. And of course, the image of the tea break as that moment where we get respite from work. And in fact, it was Charlie's own dad who had throughout the, the 70s um, and 80s drawn the Tetley tea folk. They reappear in Charlie's show um, as uh, images on a mug that is itself a kind of piece of non-artistic representation of our enjoyment in taking a break from work. So one of the kind of key things I think Charlie has learned from these complicated questions about how artists deal with work and non-work is to look at material from out with the art world, things that do not count formally as artwork, like his dad's illustrations or um, things that were made accidentally by the sun bleaching a piece of fabric and think about how they can be folded into his own work and become something that we also take a respite in away from all the demands and the hard work that often goes in to thinking about art, looking at art sometimes and I think the, the, the main takeaway I want to give you, leave you with from the show is how, how much fun Charlie Hammond makes artwork. And I'll stop there.